authentic Stella Gonet. <laughs> I guess it's the mark of real success when you have French and Saunders doing a parody of your show, don't oh, you think? Oh, absolutely. It's like being asked to go on uh, the Morecambe and Wise show, I think, you know, a few years ago. <clears throat> it was the highlight of my career. Well, I, well, I can almost imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. What are your most abiding memories of, of the House of Elliot now? Um, the fact that I think Louise and I had to change costumes about 34 times a day. <laughs> um, people always say to me, it must have been wonderful wearing all those brilliant costumes. And it was, if we'd had any length of time to wear them. Because, you know, we were rushing around so yes. much in nearly every scene, which, no, but it was brilliant. And the fact that all these gorgeous clothes were handmade for us, you know, were just brilliant. Were they really? Mm, most of them. So there was no pretense going on there. No. That was the real McCoy. Absolutely. Haute couture. Haute couture. The, the, the real thing. Why was there not another series? Because I think most people felt that it, it certainly could have carried um, a fourth. Well, I don't know. I think maybe everybody felt that it had, had come to a natural end. I don't know. I mean, after three series, I think maybe they thought it was best to go out while it was um, popular. While it was so hot, <laughs> as it were. Yeah. yeah. And then you were virtually straight back to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. You went back yeah. you were there for a second time. What is it like playing four roles I think it was in three plays all at the same time well at least sometimes within a fortnight mm. of each other how do you how do you cope with that mentally and physically mentally and physically <laughs> well physically you just have to just get on with it um, and you lose a lot of weight <laughs> mentally um, it, well, it's just such a great challenge I mean and they were there were fantastic parts to play tell us about the roles you're playing well, in the first play, I, it was a new play by Anne Devon called After Easter, where I played a woman who's been put in a psychiatric uh, ward because her husband thinks she's mad. And the play is basically she's trying to prove to everyone that she isn't mad. So there was a huge journey going on there, a mental journey going on there. Um, she's never off stage. And then in Midsummer Night's Dream, I was playing Titania and Hippolyta, so I was playing the Queen of the Fairies and then the Queen of... Um, you're doubling Greek. up on, yes. on, on those roles. Yes. Well, that's, I mean, that's a feat. As it yeah. is. And it, it, that was the production. We had that wonderful entrance that's right, in inside. <laughs> Umbrella. <laughs> Umbrella. I mean, it, breathtaking it way to, to start the play. But were there ever any problems from a technical point of view? Quite often the umbrella wouldn't come in or I'd be in the umbrella and it'd be stuck and I couldn't come on the stage. Um, there were several times when... The <laughs> When I I just have to to perform the whole thing, sort of you know, twelve feet in the air, dangling. <laughs> but, uh, what a nightmare! You know, it, it was it was gorgeous because it was just, just such a sumptuous pink, beautiful umbrella. But there was one night when it didn't come in at all, so we had to um, sort of do the whole thing with the umbrella stuck halfway, so everyone knew that it hadn't come in. So it was obvious. So you're and the poor over actors the top. sort of. <laughs> no, we were just prancing around on stage, <laughs> pretending that it was in. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You managed to work your way around yeah, it, yeah. at least. And always the audience are on your side when something like that happens, because yes. they know that it's gone wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're onto, a, onto yeah. a winner with that. Now, if you don't mind me saying, Stella Gonet sounds like a name created for a movie star. I, is that your real name? It is, yeah. <laughs> Gonet isn't a, a Scottish name? No, though. it's not. My father's Polish. And, uh, I, you know, the, the, the name is French in origin. Um, and, yeah, that, that's my mum's Scottish, and they met during the war. And, uh, was, it, was there performance in their background? Were they, none at all. Were there arts? Was there an inclination towards all of that with your No, family? no, I mean, mum, mum eventually, because um, I'm one of 12 children, and... Um, one of 12? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they never stopped? No. <laughs> Whereabouts do they you come in the, in, the, in the 12? Are you halfway I'm down? number seven. I'm right in the middle. Oh, so, um, tough, huh? Yeah, so that's why I became an actress. It was the only way I could get any attention. <laughs> <laughs> it was when I stood up on something. And, uh, but no, there's none at all. I mean, Mum eventually took a degree and became an English teacher, and she'd always had a love of language and literature. So I think she instilled that in me in a very 12 children age. and then took a degree? Yeah. <laughs> she should be on here. <laughs> She's amazing. I mean, never mind about playing four roles <laughs> no, for the RSC. No. You can, it's nothing compared you can to do what all she that. did. Absolutely. My goodness. So, where did your love of the theatre start, Stella? Well, it started at school. It started at school, and um, uh, an English teacher came to our school who wanted to put on a production of Fiddler on the Roof. So he asked me to play Gold in the Mother. So I was 14 and played a 64-year-old Jewish mother, and. Um, 
my fa it's my father's favourite musical, and his theme song is If I Were a Rich Man, because having 12 children, I think he sang that every day of his life. <laughs> 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 so that's, 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 that's where it started, and, and um, I just got the bug and, and sort of pursued it relentlessly from then on. Was it straight from drama school into the theatre? Did More you literally less. manage that lucky transition, or were there other jobs in between? No, I was very lucky. I got my first job was in Panto, and I played um, the good fairy. Oh, at last, <laughs> something a little bit closer to you, I would imagine. <laughs> in Jack and the Beanstalk, and that was, and I got my all important equity card doing that, yes. and acting ASM as well. So you're sort of doing the sweeping the floor and all that stuff as Best well. Best way to start. Absolutely, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. But let's come right up to date now and talk about what uh, mm. you're about to do or you, you've done now. I heard, I was driving along in the car, Radio 4, um, Trail put on a little tiny sneak preview of the piano. Mm. And there you are, playing the heroine, yeah. Ada, in the piano. Um, how, <laughs> I've got to ask this question, how do you portray, anyone who's seen the film or read the book will know Ada is uh, mute. How do you do that on radio? <laughs> when I was first asked to do it, I thought it was April Fool, because I thought... <laughs> This woman doesn't speak. How do I do this on the radio? But it's a wonderful adaptation being done by Michelin Wonder, um, based on the, the book from the film. And you hear her thoughts all the time. Ah, so her you thoughts are, are allowed speaking. to. And in the, in the radio, you, you sort of understand a bit more about why she chose not to speak, because it was always a choice. Mm. She made the choice at the age of seven, she's a very willful little girl, that she wasn't going to speak. And she, she didn't How for the do rest they of her do life. The sound effect where your fingers being <laughs> cut off. That was wonderful. Radio is just glorious. They used a potato and a little splinter of wood because in the in the um, film her finger is chopped off. So it sounded like it. Oh, it was wait amazing. And see. This wait and see. potato being sliced through. And now, as well as doing radio drama, we're going to see you uh, next month in a Screen One presentation, mm. uh, Trip Trap. How, what's the sort of role that you play in Trip Trap? I play a woman who's married to a man, um, played by Kevin Waitley. Um, they met, they were very in love. Um, they both had, they both had difficult backgrounds. And what comes out, what you, what you follow in the film is, 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 is the psychological journey between these two people and the trap they've got themselves into. He has started abusing her physically um, a few years into the marriage. And it's basically about how long that has gone on and how they managed to get themselves out of that trap. A very harrowing piece, I'm very. sure. Just, just tell me, though, how you both coped with the harrowing nature of the piece. How did you keep your spirits going? Well, just making each other laugh a lot. Um, in particular, I remember, Kevin, one day we were doing a scene, a particularly awful scene, where it's set in bed, um, and it was, I was very scared about it because it was the first scene where we actually... He, he was abuse, abusive, and... Um, I was very nervous about it. I came into the room and everyone was all set up and Kevin was already in the bed waiting and I pulled back the duvet to go into my side of the bed and there was a huge big spider. <laughs> you put a spider bed, in there. Which just, was great because it just cracked the it, ice. and it just lightened the just moment. Complete. So it was full of... You had to just keep having fun all the time. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we won't spot those moments though <laughs> when, when we see Trip Trap no. next month. But it's which, an uh, all too real problem. Yes, yes. And, uh, and I've had terrific things about the screen one, so I look forward to seeing it. But thank you very much for coming oh, in today. Oh, it's a great Ladies pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Stella Gone. Thank you.